Ministries podcast, No Trash, Just Truth, with hosts Chris Paxson and Rose Spiller. At Proverbs 910 Ministries, we are dedicated to taking out the trash of false teaching and replacing it with biblical truth. Welcome back. We hope you were able to catch the interview that we did last week with Shay Michael Hoodman, CEO and founder of GotQuestions.org. It was a great wrap up to the real truth about false teaching series. And I admit I was ready to be done with the false teaching and ready to get back to just real truth. (sighs) Me too. I am ready to get back to just digging in scripture and not dealing with all this false teaching. We thought a fun series to do from now till the end of the year would be, why is that in the Bible? So all of the passages that we're going to look at are real truth for sure but they may leave you scratching your head wondering why would God choose to include them or even why did they ever occur to begin with? We're going to start this week with a passage from 2 Kings chapter 2, where it seems like the prophet Elisha can't take a little teasing. And I need to give a shout out to my grandson, James Spiller, who helped me with some of my research with this. He's been excited for this, hasn't he? He has been. So... Here's the passage. It's 2 Kings 2, 23 to 25. He went up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him saying, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. And he turned around. And when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there, he went to Mount Carmel, And from there, he returned to Samaria. So does Elisha have an anger management issue? Well, let's start by filling in some background. Second Kings chapter two opens with the words, now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to the heaven by a whirlwind. If you remember the story, the prophet Elijah didn't die like the rest of us. Instead, God sent a chariot out of heaven to swoop down and carry him away. That's caused some to believe that because Elijah never actually died, that he came back as John the Baptist. And they get that from what Malachi 4 to 5 says. And God says there, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. But long story short, when you read this in context, and when you read John the Baptist's own words and Jesus's own words pertaining to this in the New Testament, you see that John the Baptist wasn't actually the reincarnated Elijah, who he couldn't have been because Elijah never died. And later, Elijah appears at Jesus's transfiguration. But instead, he was sent in the spirit of Elijah. John the Baptist is the New Testament forerunner who points the way to the arrival of the Lord, just as Elijah had done in the Old Testament. Elijah played an important role in the Old Testament. And here we see in 2 Kings 2 that his time on earth is about to come to an end. Elisha had left his farming to follow Elijah and was his dedicated student. Elijah tells Elisha that God had called him to go to Bethel. And Elijah, knowing that his time on earth was almost up, tells Elisha not to go with him. But Elisha refuses to leave Elijah's side, so they go together. This happens a couple more times with God telling Elijah to go first to Jericho and then to Jordan, and with Elijah telling Elisha both times to stay and Elisha insisting to go with him. Right before they get to the Jordan, 2 Kings 2 verse 8 says, Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to the one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. After they cross, Elijah tells Elisha to tell him what he can do for him before he's taken away from him. Elisha asks for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. So why is Elisha asking for this? Elijah was a dedicated man of God, a faithful prophet, and even a doer of miracles. You might remember he brought a woman's son back to life. And of course, there's the miracle when he went up against the Baal prophets, proving that Baal is a worthless, phony God. And he did a lot of other miracles too. And as we said, he was the Old Testament forerunner pointing to Christ. So any faithful prophet of God would want to be like Elijah. But Elisha 
is asking for a double portion of his spirit. You want to explain that, Chris? Yeah. So some people might think this was out of selfish ambition, but it wasn't. And it doesn't even mean what we might think that it does. Elisha isn't looking to be twice as great as Elijah. He doesn't want to do double the miracles or be twice as godly or get double the prophetic messages from God that Elijah did. To understand what he means, we need to flip back to Deuteronomy 21, 17. And I'll read it here. He shall acknowledge the firstborn, the son of the unloved, by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the first fruits of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. This passage is talking about if a man has more than one wife, but the decree was universal in the Old Testament. The firstborn son received a double portion of the inheritance over his younger siblings. By asking for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, Elisha is asking Elijah to recognize him as his son. And since he had no other children, he wanted to be Elijah's firstborn son. Why would he expect that, Rose? Well, again, we got to flip back a little bit, not as far as you'd went, Chris, but we got to go back to 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19 verses 19 to 21 tell us, and it says, so he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again, for what have I done for you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. Here's what Ligonier Ministry says about Elijah throwing his cloak over Elisha's shoulders. Passing by Elisha, Elijah threw his cloak on him, signifying the transfer of prophetic authority. Elisha was going to take Elijah's place as the leading prophet in Israel, but not immediately. However, Elisha immediately left his life on the family farm to fulfill his calling. He did ask for time to say goodbye to his family, which Elijah allowed, but he was no servant of the kingdom who signed up and then looked back. While saying his goodbyes, Elisha sacrificed his oxen on a fire built with the oxen yoke, demonstrating that he would never return to his former life on the farm. So from his calling, Elisha had an expectation that he would take Elijah's place in the ministry. And that explanation makes a lot more sense than thinking Elisha just wanted to be twice as great as Elijah. For one, as we're going to see in a minute, Elisha does get his request. But while Elisha was a dedicated prophet, he was certainly never superior, and many think he wasn't even equal to Elijah. Elisha just wants to take up Elijah's mantle and continue the work of God, pointing to the Messiah as Elijah had done. Elisha's request was out of expectation from his calling, love for Elijah, and eagerness to serve God by glorifying him, being God's messenger, and steering the Israelites away from their idolatry and syncretism. It was common for disciples of teachers to be called their children. Elisha is looking for an affirmation that he is Elijah's top disciple, his firstborn, so to speak. Elijah tells Elisha to ask anything of him before he goes, and all Elisha asks for is the power to execute the office of prophet well and be heir to Elijah's ministry. It was a lot like Solomon when God said that he would give him anything, and then Solomon asked for wisdom to govern wisely. That's what it was like. Right. So 2 Kings chapter 2 continues with Elijah recognizing that what Elisha is asking is not for him to give. He says it's a hard thing you ask because it's only for God to give. Elisha is asking for the Holy Spirit to doubly indwell in him. And Elijah knows, of course, that that's not up to him to give. God decides who's indwelled with the Holy Spirit. So Elijah tells him in 2 Kings 2.10, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, 
it shall not be so. Augustine makes an interesting observation here. He notes that this request for a double portion of the Holy Spirit tells us something about the Spirit's work amongst his people. He said, and I'm quoting here, he who is everywhere does not dwell in all, and he does not even dwell equally in those in whom he does dwell. Otherwise, what is the meaning of the request made by Elisha that there might be in him double the spirit of God that was in Elijah? And how is it that among the saints, some are more holy than others, except that they have a more abundant indwelling of God? And that's the end of the Augustine quote. Another commentator puts it this way. If we consider Elijah as a type of Christ who ascends into heaven and pours out the spirit upon his disciples at Pentecost, who then in the power of the spirit performs signs and wonders in the book of Acts, we could see Elisha as a type of spirit empowered church as well. It's interesting. Very profound observations, both of them. Verse 12 confirms that Elisha's request has been granted and that it had to do with him considering himself Elijah's son, as he does see Elijah being taken up into heaven. And he says, as he sees him, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. Elisha then picks up Elijah's cloak after Elijah disappears, and he wants to see if God has indeed gifted him with his request. So he takes the cloak and he strikes the water of the Jordan on the bank. As we said, Elijah had just done the same thing when they arrived at Jordan and the water parts. This confirms that God has granted Elisha Elijah's ministry. And it's further confirmed in 2 Kings 2.15, where it says, Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him, meaning Elisha, opposite them, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. So before we get to the bear incident, there are two other odd incidents in 2 Kings 2, 16 to 22. The men who had just bowed down to him asked Elisha to let them send 50 strong men who are with them to go and look for Elijah because it may be that God has thrown him on some mountain or into a valley. Sounds crazy, but that's what they did. Just seeing God throw somebody. <laughs> yeah. So Elisha tells them no, that they're not to search, but they keep badgering him until, as the text says, he was ashamed and he tells them, fine, go ahead and look for Elijah. The original Hebrew used for ashamed could mean disconcerted or disappointed or to feel shame. But you can kind of picture these guys wearing Elisha down and then him just saying, fine, go look for him. That's what I would have probably said. <laughs> you know, no surprise though. They come back after three days and guess what? No, Elijah. Elijah God hadn't thrown him. him. Nope. Nope. They didn't find him. He didn't fall he out of the chariot. Down. No throw down here. So Elisha tells them in second Kings 218, did I not say to you, do not go. Kind of Elisha's way of saying, I told you so. Yeah. The second incident is the first recorded miracle that Elisha performs, other than when he hit Elijah's cloak on the water and the Jordan River parted. The men of the city, not the same sons of the prophets from that you were just talking about, Chris. These are just men of the city. They come to Elisha and tell them that their land is fruitful, but the water is bad. They need clean water to produce crops. The water's polluted. It was so polluted, it was killing people, and it was causing the women to have miscarriages. Second Kings 2, 20 to 22, records the miracle. It says, he, meaning Elisha, said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water and threw the salt in it and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. That's the end of scripture. So Elisha was taking up the mantle of Elijah, of warning the Israelites to stop the idolatry and syncretism and to turn to God, pointing to God's coming judgment and the coming Messiah, which is Jesus, of course. 
it's very fitting that Elisha's first miracle is to clean up the polluted water so that the land and the people can again be fruitful and multiply. There are so many symbolic things in this miracle. First, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount tells us that we're the salt of the earth. He's referring back to the salt covenant in Leviticus 2.13, which says, You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. And that's the end of the scripture. Jesus said that his people are to be the salt of the earth, meaning that we're to season a corrupt and polluted world with God's truth. We're to preserve his truth by proclaiming it and living it. If we don't, then we're pretty useless. Yep. Polluted waters are also talked about in Revelation. It's one of the judgments that God is and will impose on the world. Revelation 8.11 says a third of the waters became wormwood and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Later in the bowl judgments, God completely pollutes the water, killing all of the sea life and making it impossible for anyone to drink from it. So Elisha starts his mission as a prophet, warning the Israelites about their idolatry and syncretism and God's coming judgment and pointing to the coming Messiah by cleaning up the polluted water in Jericho with salt. It's right after this that the bear incident occurs. And we've told you all that we have because we wanted to show you a little of who Elisha is. And although we don't have time to go into more, there's seven more chapters in the book of Second Kings that tell of the miracles Elisha did and tell more about who he is. Okay, so... Let's read this famous or maybe infamous passage one more time, and then we'll start digging into it. Second Kings 2, 23 to 25 says, he, meaning Elisha, went up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him saying, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head. And he turned around. And when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord and two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there, he went to Mount Carmel, and from there, he returned to Samaria. And that's the end of the scripture. When we first read this story, we aren't sure if we should laugh or be deeply disturbed. And we should say that this is it on the passage. There's nothing else ever mentioned again in any part of scripture. Yeah. It seems that, like we said earlier, that Elisha has a severe anger management problem. Okay, it was mean to call him bald head, but having two bears tear up 42 boys, well, that's a little overkill. And where was God in all this? Obviously, even though it was Elisha who spoke the miracle in God's name, God was certainly the one who ultimately allowed it to happen. So what the heck is going on here? We started with all that information on Elisha to show you that he was a serious godly prophet who took his appointment extremely seriously. But that doesn't mean that this narrative shouldn't disturb us. In fact, it's the very reason it's in there. Yeah. While traveling on Elijah's last prophet circuit, Elijah and Elisha went from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan. Elisha is backtracking that route now. Jordan is where Elijah was taken up to heaven and Elisha was able to part the Jordan River. Jericho is where the sons of the prophets recognize Elisha as Elijah's replacement and the men of the city came to him to heal the polluted water. Now he's entering Bethel and it's in Bethel that the bear narrative takes place. The name Bethel means house of God and that's ironic for sure, since one of the most corrupt and false churches today is called Bethel Church. <laughs> but that's just a side note. Anyway, <laughs> you know, Bethel was a significant place prior to Elisha going there. In Genesis 28, it was where God revealed himself to Jacob. And Jacob anointed a pillar to show that he was dedicating himself to Yahweh. It was part of the promised land where God commanded Joshua to overthrow. He ordered Joshua to set up an ambush for Bethel and I. Every man and many women and children in both pagan towns were killed. 
Joshua set stones in a pillar, much like Jacob's, and made an offering as a covenant between the Israelites and God. Bethel was also where the northern nation of Israel's first king, Jeroboam, set up golden calves to worship because he didn't want the people of Israel going to Jerusalem, which was in the southern nation of Judah, to worship God. And that's all in 1 Kings 12. And this idol worship in Bethel that Jeroboam started continued all the way up to Elisha's time. Unlike Joshua, who when he entered Bethel expected it to be pagan, Elisha would have expected the people to be worshiping God. They were Israelites, not pagans. Well, they were pagans, but they were Israelites. But they weren't worshiping God, not at all. In fact, they're more guilty than the pagans that Joshua encountered because those people didn't know God at all. The people Elisha encounters, like we said, were Israelites. They should have known about both Jacob's covenant and Joshua's covenant made in Bethel. And that all should have been handed down to them. Yeah. And they should have been following the one true God who led them from slavery in Egypt and gave them the promised land. But like you said, they weren't. So Elisha calling a curse down on the town seems much more understandable now. I want to note something fascinating, and I'm quoting Dan Hoffman from knowingscripture.com. He observes this, and I'm quoting here. Notice here that Elisha foreshadows Jesus, especially the pattern in the Gospel of John. After being anointed at the Jordan by John the Baptist, and John the Baptist, of course, is like Elijah, Jesus, clothed with the Spirit, goes out performing signs. In the Gospel of John, his first two signs are changing the water into wine, as Elisha purified the water of Jericho, and then pronouncing judgment on the temple, the house of God, just as Elisha brought judgment to God's corrupted house of God, quote unquote, at Bethel. Good quote. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Elisha is a type of Jesus, but would Jesus actually sick two bears on 42 small boys? Well, maybe this is a case where translation from the original Hebrew can cause an issue. The original Hebrew word nahar used for boys, small boys, little children, as most translations use in this passage, could mean small children, could mean boys, could mean small boys, but it could also mean older boys, like young men. Nahar is the same word used in Genesis 14, 24, which says, I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. In this passage, Abram is talking about the military men with him. So the young men, Nahar, are at least old enough to fight as a soldier. In fact, Nahar is used several more times in the book of Genesis, and it all means young men. In Exodus 24, 5, it's used to describe the young men of Israel. Exodus 33, 11 uses Nahar to describe Joshua while he was Moses' aide. And we'll just do one more. Nahar is used to describe the false prophet Balaam's servant who was with him in Numbers 22, 22. And there's a lot of other places it's used. And the vast majority of times, it's used to mean young men probably between the ages of 16 to 20, not small boys. Right. So does it make a difference that these were most likely not small boys, but young men? Well, absolutely. The writer serves up a direct contrast in this chapter with the sons of the prophets from Jericho who bowed down to Elisha, recognizing his station. The men of Jericho who also recognized Elisha and his station and asked him to intervene on their behalf with God. And these, I'm going to say foolish young men of Bethel, sinful young men of Bethel, who show nothing but disrespect and contempt for him. And since this contrast is made here, it's very likely these young men were part of the idolatrous group of Israelites that were in Bethel. Yeah, I agree. So we see these are not the innocent little boys. Many who have read this passage believe they were. There was a time when I believed that. But what about Elisha? If we use scripture as a timeline, we see that Elisha would have been roughly 30 years old, maybe slightly younger when this incident occurs. So it's not some crotchety old man versus little children. 
these men are all pretty much peers. Okay, so let's look at the insult. What was the big deal about calling Elisha bald head? He could have very well been bald or losing his hair. We certainly see many men around 30 who are bald or losing their hair. It's possible also that Elisha had shaved his head out of mourning for Elijah, whom he considered his father. Shaving your head was a sign of mourning, as Job 1, 19 and 20 tells us. And that says, the house collapsed and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. And we just want to note, priests were forbidden from shaving their heads according to Mosaic law. But Elisha is not a priest. He's a prophet. So it was okay if he had done that. And we just want to make that clear. Right. So they could have been mocking his appearance or they could have been mocking his grief or it could be something even more serious. If these young men are part of the idolatrous Israelites, this taunt could be in answer to Elijah's taunt of them back in 1 Kings 18. It was in that chapter that Elijah challenged the idolatrous Israelites who were following the Baals, which were false gods, under King Ahab. That's what they were doing it under King Ahab. If you remember, Elijah challenged them to put their gods up against Yahweh by seeing who could start a fire. Even after praying and screaming and cutting themselves, the Baal prophets couldn't get Baal to start a fire because, of course, he is a phony <laughs> god. I love that passage, by the way. Me too. You know, but God started a fire after the wood was drenched with 12 large jars of water. Elijah taunted 450 Baal prophets during their failed attempt to start the fire. And he was saying things like maybe Baal was hard of hearing or maybe Baal was busy in the bathroom. After the Lord God sends fire from heaven and sets the wood and offering a flame, Elijah has 450, all 450 of the prophets killed. In 2 Kings 1, the chapter right before the bear incident, Elijah sends a message to King Ahasia, who's the successor of King Ahab in the northern nation of Israel. He says that God has told him that the king will die from recently sustained injuries. When King Ahasia asked who it was that sent the message to him, his men say it was a hairy man. Immediately, King Ahasia knows that they're talking about Elijah. So apparently Elijah was hairy. So this taunt of bald head to Elisha could be them saying, you will never be anything like Elijah or without Elijah, you are nothing, you're bald. So this all starts to put things into a little different perspective. We don't have little children who are spouting mean taunts unaware of what they're doing. We have young men who are in rebellion against God who surely feel contempt for God and his prophets for putting their false prophets to death and are lashing out at God through Elisha. And they're saying Elisha is nothing and he's powerless. They never learn. No, they don't. And we told the story of Elijah putting 450 Baal prophets to death after challenging God to show that these men had a lot of resentment towards God and his prophets but also to show that God does not take a direct challenge to his sovereignty, his power, or his authority very lightly. He had Elijah kill 450 prophets, not one or two or 10 to make a point, all 450. So God having Elisha call down a curse on these young men is not far-fetched, not at all, really. So now we're left with just two questions. Why bears? And did the bears kill all of the young men or not? So let's start with why bears, Rose? Well, we can start answering that question by, again, flipping earlier in the Old Testament back to Leviticus chapter 26. That's the chapter where God lays out his covenant with the Israelites. He tells them of blessings they will receive for obedience and curses they'll receive for disobedience. In the curses for disobedience section, God tells them, He's going to step up the curses for continued disobedience. He says at first, 
He's going to bring wasting diseases and burning fevers that will cause blindness and death. They'll have enemies that will overthrow them and eat their crops and rule over them. But if they're still disobedient, God's going to punish them seven times over for their sins and bring a drought. And that was the stage where they were when Elijah defeated the Baal prophets. They were in the midst of a drought. It was the third year of one. And if they were still disobedient after that, God tells them in Leviticus 26, 21, if even then you remain hostile towards me and refuse to obey me, I will inflict disaster on you seven times over for your sins. I will send wild animals that will rob you of your children and destroy your livestock. Your numbers will dwindle and your roads will be deserted. Well, that gives us a much fuller picture, doesn't it? It sure does. Great reason why it's important to know the whole counsel of the Bible and not just some narratives and verses that are sticking out from it. In fact, when you put things into context like that, sending bears to attack these young men is along the lines of what should have been expected. It goes right along with what God says. And just a note before we finish up the story, God goes on increasing those curses for the continued disobedience in Leviticus 26 to include his sending the Israelites enemy armies against them to overthrow them and them being handed over to those enemies. And guess what? The Israelites would be left starving to the point of eating their own children. All of those things happened exactly as God said they would because the Israelites kept on with their disobedience. Yeah, despite the incident with Elijah and the Baal prophets, that didn't stop their idol worship. And, you know, we could be shaking our heads. I remember the first time I read through the Old Testament, I was like, what's with these Israelites? Despite what happens with these 42 men here, them being torn up, they still don't stop, which is why, like you said, Chris, they end up in exile and starving and eating their own children. Despite warning after warning and God sending partial curses on them, they didn't stop their disobedience. And like I said, it may have a shaking our head thinking, what is with them? But guess what? Nothing's changed. We no. see in Revelation that the exact same thing is still going on and is going to continue to go on. When God is executing his judgment on the world, Revelation 16, 11 paints a picture for us. It says, then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. His subjects ground their teeth in anguish and they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores, but they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. <laughs> no matter how bad it gets, they don't. Nope. The evil keeps happening and they never repent, no matter how bad it gets for them. And that picture in Revelation is the bold judgments and his judgment that's poured out on all unbelievers. Now, getting back to Elisha and the bear, let's answer that last question. Did the bears kill all the young men? Well, we can't know for sure. The text says that 42 of them were torn. And we know that God promised to, they would lose their children and go down in number. So we don't know how many boys there were. We don't know if 42 was all of them or just some. Since the text makes it a point to say 42 were torn up, the best guess is that that wasn't all of them. Otherwise, you would expect the wording to be that the bears tore them up without naming a specific number. So it's most likely not all of them. But Rose, did they kill them? Well, again, we don't know for sure. Another translation for tore up is mauled. In fact, the New Living Translation uses mauled instead of tore up. There have been many incidents of bear maulings where the victims survived. And of course, there's been many incidents of bear maulings where the victims have died. So we can't really answer this question. If we go back to Leviticus 26, like you just did, Chris, God says the curse for disobedience would be sending wild animals to rob the Israelites of their children. So it makes us think, they were probably killed. But honestly, the text doesn't tell us specifically, so we just don't know. But what we do know is that this narrative about a prophet who six bears on some youth is not just an odd story that the author of Second Kings stuck into scripture. 
It has connections to things prior to its occurrence and connections to things in the future of its occurrence. Yeah, that's the beauty of scripture. It's all mm -hmm. connected and woven together. Well, that's all we have time for today. We hope you enjoyed our first episode of Why Is That in the Bible? Be sure to join us next week as we look at the passage of Joshua commanding the sun to stand still. If you're enjoying this podcast, please recommend it to a friend. And also, please do us a huge favor by subscribing and leaving a review on whatever platform you're listening on. Have a blessed day, everyone.